Okay, in this lesson we'll take a look at neuron structure and function, and then we'll try to figure out how it is that electricity and chemistry can represent qualities about the world. Here we have our left hemisphere. We've already studied some of the, the regions of the cerebral cortex, auditory cortex, visual cortex. We've got the what visual pathway here, the where pathway up here. We've got somatosensory cortex, frontal lobe over here. It's time now to look more deeply into what the basic elements of a brain are, and those are brain cells or neurons. So there are many different kinds of neurons, but uh, many of them have these features in common. They have a cell body where the nucleus would be, and there's DNA in there. And then the cell body has a bunch of these branches called dendrites. These dendrites are the sort of receiving part of the cell. So information from other uh, brain cells will be communicated to the uh, cell on these branches. Coming out from the cell body is a long fiber called the axon. So this would be the output cable of the neuron. Dendrites getting input, the axon is the output system. Uh, the cell is going to make an electrical signal that will travel down the axon to the terminal. And here we'll see uh, the activity at the terminal will influence the uh, activity of some target cell. So these are the four parts of uh, a neuron that we'll have to know and uh, the dendrites their their job is to receive chemical signals from many other neurons and convert them into electrical signals that's the language of the brain the cell body integrates the electrical activity of all the inputs and metaphorically decides to generate an electrical signal called an action potential the axon the output cable right would propagate the electrical signal uh, down to the axon terminal and then the axon terminal is going to be releasing chemicals called neurotransmitters to influence the electrical activity of the target cell. Here we see a hippocampal cell, cell body, extensive set of dendrites, axons coming out here. Here we see uh, a subset of cells stained in visual cortex, so the, the dark blobs would be the, the cell bodies, and then you see a whole bunch of branching fibers, uh, dendrites and axons mixed in there. It's helpful now to take a let's look at a little animation here. Get a sense of what a neuron is doing. So in this animation, we've got the cell body here. We've got the dendrites out here. And you'll notice these little red things coming down here. That would uh, indicate that there's some electrical activity from some other nerve cell that has uh, stimulated this cell here. So we've got little electrical signals coming down to the cell body. The cell body is seen here to be generating another electrical signal, that fast yellow one, that's called the action potential and it travels down the length of the axon to the terminal and at the terminal uh, we'll see in a moment that the chemicals will be released that will influence the electrical activity of the target cell. Now this axon is covered with myelin and that myelin speeds up the conduction of the action potential so fast uh, uh, signaling here compared to unmyelinated axons um, and it also gives a kind of a white color to the nerve fibers so when brain scientists, scientists talk about gray matter and white matter the gray matter tends to be the cell bodies and their branches and the white matter are the fibers that are often myelinated especially if the brain cell has to talk to another cell over a, a, a great distance those axons are usually myelinated all right now how does a neuron generate an electrical signal? How does it carry an electrical impulse down the axon? Well, the basic idea is that uh, in the membrane of the axon are protein channels. These are ion channels. And when they open up, charged particles, ions like sodium and potassium and chloride and calcium and so on, when they move across the membrane, that is an electrical current, right? So the movement of charged particles is an electrical current. But that's a movement from, in this case, outside the cell to inside the cell. Uh, how, do, how do you get an electrical disturbance going down the length of the axon? To see that, we have to look at the arrangement of these uh, ion channels along the axon. Here we see the membrane of the axon, and we've got two sets of channels. 
Uh, the green ones here are sodium channels, and the blue ones here would be potassium channels. Now it turns out that there's a lot of sodium outside the cell, so when these green channels open, the sodium comes rushing in. Sodium comes rushing in, but when sodium comes rushing in, it opens up the nearby potassium channels. Turns out there's a lot of potassium inside the cell. When those channels open up, they uh, rush out, right? And uh, uh, the neighboring sodium channels are also opened up uh, by the activity of the first channels here. So what you get in the end is this domino effect of the sequential opening of channels that are allowing sodium and ion, or sodium and potassium ions across the membrane. Now to see the activity of just one pair of channels, we can take a, a look at this animation. Here we have the sodium channel opening up, sodium comes rushing in, and that event opens up the nearby potassium channels. Potassium at high concentration inside the cell is rushing out, and so we get this, again, sequential opening of channels, and this kind of uh, pattern of activity happens all the way down the, uh, the axon. So that's an all or none electrical disturbance that once it's started at the cell body, it will continue down to the terminal. It's called the action potential. Okay, so uh, when the electrical disturbance, the action potential, gets down to the uh, terminal, what we have now is a space. There's a gap between the terminal and the target cell. That gap is called the synaptic gap, and so this junction here is called a synapse. So we can define the postsynaptic membrane, the presynaptic terminal, and this is the where the chemical nature of neurons will come into play. But before we discuss what happens at the synapse, let's Let's take a look at a synapse. Here we see a, uh, a nerve fiber here um, making contact with multiple muscle cells. So the red strips here are individual muscle cells. And uh, you, can, you can see the uh, axon here is branching off into multiple terminals, and each terminal is synapsing on a muscle cell. If we were to take a look with an electron microscope at uh, what the, like a cross section of this junction here, this synapse, what we see is something like this. This would be the presynaptic terminal. This would be the postsynaptic cell down here. So here's the membrane of the postsynaptic cell, the muscle cell. And this would be the membrane right up in here of the terminal. You can see the gap between the two is really small, right? So the synaptic gap is very, very tiny. But inside the terminal, you see a bunch of mitochondria here, which provide energy. Uh, but you also see a whole bunch of these, get rid of that, a whole bunch of these uh, little circles here. We'll call them vesicles. They're called synaptic vesicles. Inside these little chambers are chemicals. The neurotransmitters are inside those chambers waiting to be released into the gap to influence the target cell. Let's take a look at another electron microscope picture here. Again, we see a nerve terminal, and now we can again clearly identify the vesicles, and then here we have two s synapses here, and you can kind of see it's a little darker whenever there's a, a synapse on the target cell. The, the membrane region uh, under the electron microscope is a little bit darker there. Here we see uh, another image of this, again the presynaptic terminal membrane. We see vesicles, the target cell membrane. And we've captured here a couple of those vesicles in the act of fusing with the terminal membrane. You'll see that's going to be important for releasing the contents of the vesicles. Those uh, chemicals are going to diffuse across the gap and influence the target cell. So the chemistry involves the following. So neurons send their electrical signals down the axon, but the axon terminal does not actually touch the target cell. The junction of the axon terminal and the target cell is called the synapse. Axon terminals release chemicals across the synapse with which electrically excite the target cell, thus generating a response which can possibly be communicated to the cell body and possibly produce an action potential. This would be a cartoon of the situation. We have one cell going to make a synapse with a target cell here. Here we've got the terminal, the target cell, 
and we've got vesicles in the terminal. They're filled with neurotransmitter molecules. When the vesicles fuse with the terminal membrane, the transmitters are released. They diffuse across that tiny gap. They bind to uh, protein receptors on the target cell membrane. When they bind to the receptor, a channel opens up, and then other ions that are in the fluid here, ions can move into the target cell, and that generates an electrical signal in the target cell. Let's take a look at what that would look like with our animations. Here we see the electrical disturbance coming down here, the action potential. Remember the dominoes of those channels opening up, and sodium and potassium ions are rushing back and forth across the membrane. Comes down here to the terminal. The blue uh, channels are calcium channels. Calcium, high concentration outside, will rush into the cell. There's a series of events that lead the uh, vesicles to move towards the membrane. They fuse with the terminal membrane. The red stuff coming out here would be neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitters dif diffuse across, bind to the yellow uh, postsynaptic uh, receptors, and then they open up, and then the yellow stuff going in would be other ions in the fluid rushing in to create an electrical signal in the target cell. So again, we've got the action potential coming down here. The blue coming in would be calcium rushing in, the vesicles fuse, the red is the neurotransmitters being released, and the yellow would be other charged ions rushing into the cell, the target cell. Okay. Let's just do one more animation of that. We're going to click play here. Here comes the action potential down to the terminal. The vesicles migrate to the terminal membrane, neurotransmitters, the red things diffuse across. Disregard this for a second. Here come the red uh, the neurotransmitters are going to bind to the protein channel, other ions, the blue things, ions rushing into the target cell. That'll start an electrical signal in the target cell. Now the little red ones that we're going back in here illustrates that uh, every synapse has some way to shut down the signal. Right? You've got to get rid of the neurotransmitters. So some cells will uh, recycle the neurotransmitters. They will absorb them back into the terminal. Uh, some synapses have enzymes in the fluid that will deactivate the neurotransmitter. And some transmitters will just diffuse away. Okay. Now let's take a, a closer look at, uh, at the dendrites, a little bit the, the sites of many of the synapses. So here we see a bipolar neuron, so here's a cell body and two sets of dendrites. The axon is this little thin thing coming out there. But if we take a closer look at dendrites, we'll see they're covered with these little bumps. We'll call them spines. And these spines are thought to be the, the actual uh, sites of the synapses. So the target cell here has these little bumps, these spines that is the uh, site of the synapse. And using electron microscopes and computer reconstructions of, of those uh, pictures, this would be a model of what a, a, a dendrite might look like, filled with these spines. You notice they have different uh, shapes and sizes. In fact, that's interesting to neuroscientists because uh, it is believed that when we learn something, uh, synapses are changing their strength. And one way to make a long-term change in a synapse is to change the anatomical structure of the spines. And so it's thought that long-term memory may be um, uh, produced by, by uh, changes in the spines such that the, the synapse is strengthened due to the uh, altered uh, anatomical structure of the spine itself. In fact, in in one recent study, scientists were able to use techniques I'm not going to go into here, but to uh, try to monitor the activity in spines along a dendrite. So here we see one spine, another, 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 another. Uh, and they uh, gathered evidence that they could sort of witness a spine changing uh, as the input to that spine was, was active. So the, uh, this synapse was active, and that spine was responding to repeated activity by changing its uh, characteristics, whereas other spines that did not have ongoing activity from inputs, so no synapses were active, no terminals were releasing chemicals here, these uh, inputs, uh, they don't show 
as such changes. So here we see sort of a summary diagram of the chemistry of neurons. The chemistry occurs at the synapse. The action potential uh, comes down to the terminal. Uh, transmitters are going to be released as the vesicles fuse. They will diffuse across, bind to receptors, channels open, charged ions flow in. You get a uh, electrical response in the target cell. Now in addition to changing the morphology of the spines, that might account for some long-term uh, changes to synapses, there can be shorter term changes in synapses. Uh, so for example, um, one way to increase the strength of a synapse would be to release more transmitter. And we'll see that there's some evidence for this. Uh, another way to increase the strength of a synapse would be to, to build more receptors on the target a cell membrane. Uh, and again, there, there is some evidence for that type of thing. So we can have short-term changes in synaptic communication and then longer anatomical changes uh, in synapses. Now let's take a look at how the target cell might respond differently depending on the nature of the activity in the presynaptic terminal. So up here in the top here we have, let's say we have a, an axon and terminal where one little electrical disturbance, one little action potential signal is coming down here, right? Uh, well, a certain amount of transmitters will be released. And since it's uh, not, uh, not a big signal, since it, uh, uh, not many transmitters are released, not many uh, receptor channels are open, not many ions go in, so you'll get some kind of small electrical disturbance. In fact, this target cell might not even respond with its own action potential. Well, what would happen if instead of one action potential, you had a series of action potentials coming down here to the terminal? Well, you're going to get the release of more transmitter, more uh, channels opened up, more ions into the target cell, and perhaps you'll get some response. Maybe the target cell produces a couple of action potentials on its own. Down here, if we have a lot of action potentials uh, he heading down to the terminal, we're going to get a lot of release of neurotransmitters, more ions into the target cell. Look at the response. Again, high frequency action potentials. So notice then the target cell can respond differently. It'll make a different sort of output uh, depending on the nature of the input. For weak inputs, it might uh, not make an action potential at all. For medium input activity, it'll make low frequency response, low frequency action potentials of its own. For high frequency input, high frequency response. The difference between not making anything at all and generating an action potential, uh, we can call that the threshold. So in this middle one here, the activity of the input here, the input uh, terminal here, was enough to exceed the threshold of this target cell. So it will now generate an action potential. And this is what we mean by uh, neurons are making a decision, right? So depending on the activity on all of its dendrites, the, the neuron is going to metaphorically decide to make an output signal. That activity has to exceed some kind of threshold, some electrical threshold, in order for that those channels to start opening up and you get the domino effect all or none uh, action potential all the way down to the terminal. It's fun to think about whether if this is really what neurons are doing, just sort of making these little decisions, these computations, you know, could you replace neurons with silicon chips that, that had the same input-output relations, the same functional architecture as brains? And then would you have a brain that was conscious, for example? It's fun to think about. But it's a little more complicated because some of the inputs to a target cell can be inhibitory. So here we have the green one here would be an excitatory uh, input. And it's excitatory because the particular neurotransmitter receptor combination allows positively charged ions in, so say sodium, uh, and that will tend to excite the target cell. So if positive ions come into the target cell, the cell will will be excited and it will be more likely to send an action t uh, potential. But at the same time, what might be happening is there is an inhibitory input to the target cell, meaning that these particular neurotransmitters and their associated receptors, when those channels open up, negative ions go in, maybe like chloride ions. If negative ions go in, that's going to tend to inhibit the target cell. It will tend to make it so that it does not make an, an action potential. So 
depending on the level of excitation, if there's high excitation, you'll have high frequency action tensions. If there's low excitation, low frequency uh, uh, action tensions. And if the excitation is low enough, you might not get any action tensions. Inhibition, um, the result, if you're, if you're inhibiting the target cell, you're going to reduce the, if it, it's already kind of making action potentials at some baseline level, you'll reduce that output even further. And then you, the, you have to add the two together that this neuron here is going to be, in a sense, making a decision based on all of its inputs. So there's going to be some kind of summation going on. Uh, that the, the inhibition at this synapse can, in a sense, cancel out the excitation at this synapse and keep this cell quiet. You can kind of see a little example of this in this animation. So here we have uh, a neuron here. It's generating an action potential. You see the yellow one zipping down there. Now we're going to click the, uh, the little link here, and then the, the blue one is going to... Okay, so wait. So here we go. Now what we got here is this is the, the normal state. So we've got uh, this cell is sending action potentials now. Now I'm going to click. Now the, the blue one here is inhibiting the target cell. So what you, it's hard to see, but what you should see is that the frequency of, of signals here is reduced when the inhibitory neuron is having its effect on the target cell. So you can see the frequency of it's shooting down there with higher frequency than if I activate the inhibitory neuron. Not so easy to see. Okay, so this, uh, this diagram summarizes this idea again that the postsynaptic cell is going to be summating all of its inputs, some of which may be excitatory, but some of which may be inhibitory. And uh, if the overall excitation reaches a threshold, it will generate its electrical signal, the action potential.